Hi everyone. CPI day, so I'm not going to take up a lot of time so Blake could get in his analysis prior to the release. Hope everyone's doing great. I uh, have an excellent guest, David Brady. I know a lot of you guys know him from at Global Pro Traders. Uh, David really believes that we went through a threshold and a crisis is upon us, so it's going to be very interesting to hear David's presentation, what instruments he's planning on capitalizing on this change of uh, happy days are here again forever and ever. And everyone that knows me and has followed me around for a while know I'm a big believer in social trading and even bigger believer in intelligence gathering. And one of my favorite expressions is surround yourself with traders better than you. So, you know, crude is, I was looking for sub 60 and, you know, 58, 55. I'm wondering what I should do. I think I'll do a little intelligence gathering here. Uh, gee, I wonder what, I wish I knew what Greg Horvat was thinking. I interviewed him once on FX Street and he won an award and everything. So, oh, look, here's Greg Horvat right here. Here's his WTI Elliott Wave analysis. Look at that. And a four hour. Look at that. So I think I'll do a little intelligence gathering, take a look at this chart here. Oh, so we're in a four to complete a five, which is an area that um, I talked about originally and then thought we wouldn't get down there, but it looks like about 56 after a little sideways action, which we're getting. Isn't that cool? So that kind of backs up what I'm thinking. But you know what? I'd like to back that up with, huh, you know, that Blake Morrow guy, it's pretty good. I interviewed him a few times on FX Street. I wonder what he's thinking about the crude in here. Oh, here we go. Oh, Blake Morrow does the basic technical. So no change in analysis is managing to hold 59.26, but doesn't think a uh, bounce is going to be a sale. So what's Blake have on his chart here? Okay, he's got some fibs. Huh, okay. Pretty good intelligence gathering there. So, uh, you know, um, both of them think lower numbers. Um, I'm thinking lower numbers. So I'm going to stalk the crude over the next few days around the, after we get a little consolidation, the next flush, I'll start looking for for some divergences in the crude. Man, isn't it cool to have access to people's work you respect any time? You know, what if Blake was on vacation? Greg is out on its Harley in Slovakia. I can't call them. But their work is right here at my fingertips. It's a major part of my intelligence gathering, as are the guests that I bring in all the time for our community so if you haven't tried our traffic light page i think it would be a great tool in what you're trying to accomplish as a trader test drive our traffic light page and you're going to have a lot of information to put into your decision making before you're compelled to take risk so with all that being said, let's take a look at a few of the majors here. So, you know, I've seen counts that this is a failing rally. We're going to 121. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are expecting a hot number. So we'll see what happens if uh, the market gets what it wants. Despite the euro being down again, as you can see, it's not down as much as cable. So, you know, what I've been pounding the drum on for quite some time, a few hundred pips now, uh, we're knocking at the door at major resistance on the euro pound. I know Steve says it's a non-trade, may even be a non-trade till here, but um, I'm still thinking that we're going to make a move out of this congestion here. Almost looks like it's starting to happen if you just draw a little downtrend line off this top and this top starting to cut through here. So this might be a candidate for me if they do uh, take euro pound down to buy a break. I don't know if they're going to. Um, 
I think breaks should be held. If you bought it down here last week, around 88.66, uh, made a point to show people something here on the uh, VIX, and I know the market's rallying. In fact, uh, what I said Monday might have been far-fetched, and it still could be, where I was talking about the two-week off number is right here, and that sometimes they're magnets, 2750.80 2750, is the two-week off number. So we'll see. I'm not prepared to short the S&Ps here. I, up at 27.50, that's a different story for me. And the gold is still acting okay from the 13.10 level. So I know Steve is bearish. And the yen, they're going to have to rename it to, uh, Steve, what's the name of the uh, currency in Venezuela? that uh, there's been hyperinflation with it. It's Bolivar. the Bolivar. The Bolivar, okay. But the yen is strong, so it's the opposite of the Bolivar. So, uh, you know, if you've been in face, you're not long in. You're not long in from what's happening in your free seminar, webinar, and you're definitely not long in from anything that came from the team. So I, I bet there's a lot of people in our community that actually have capitalized on the warning of yen weakness, yen strength. And, you know, that's what I have to say is that every morning, even on the weekends when I'm thinking about what I'm going to do, I have this at my fingertips. So I used to have to go search all over the web or invite these guys to be interviewed. I even interviewed Steve Volge, even though I don't remember it. Uh, Steve, did you save the recording of that interview? I think I have the link somewhere, uh, yeah. Oh, well, I'd like to see it. Sure, absolutely. So I, can, so I could evaluate whether I made the right decision to hang out with you for the last 10 months. <laughs> All right, no, anyway. <laughs> so, you know, don't do anything big before the CPI. Just my vibe is everyone looking for a hot number. Uh, uh, I don't think yesterday's bar in the dollar was so, a candle in the dollar was so great. You know, we're flirting with this line again here. And I didn't like some of the short-term RSI readings down here. See, confirmed. But if it's going to hold, this is a good place for it to hold and give us another one of these. But I still think eventually, I don't know if it's going to be from these highs, which I was negative from last week, although a day early for this spike here or it's gonna, where we have one more rally up towards 91, 91 and a half, something even 92. Today will tell us though, guys, right? Uh, at least not the initial reaction, but after all the noise is out of the way on the CPI, we'll see if people fade it. So I'm thinking it might be a fade on strength, but that's just my guess going in. And uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to what keeps me uh, level-headed in the market, and uh, that's the analysis of Blake Morrow. Hey, good morning, Dale. How are you? Hey, good, partner. Uh, I well, was. Uh, you locked uh, and loaded. I am. I'm. Yeah. Th this is a very important. Um, this is a very important day for for the for the market. Um, CPI, obviously, uh, the inflation data is what everybody's looking at. I really don't have any expectations at this moment, um, but. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that that if if everybody's looking at the everybody's looking at the core CPI, all right. So core CPI is expected to come in at 0.2 percent. 0.2 percent is going to be uh, how should I say maybe, maybe more of a relief for the market. The market will will say okay, it's the inflation's not too hot. It's like your porridge, you know, it's not too hot, not too cold. Um, Fine, you know, it's going to be good. But if that core CPI print comes in hotter than 0.2%, we come in at 0.3% or better, um, the market's going to come under pressure. Bond, bonds are going to fall, yields are going to rally, and um, and stocks probably will come under pressure as a result. So that that's the reaction that, that I think everybody's got to be a little careful of is if inflation comes in too hot. Uh, but, you know, we've been for the longest time, uh, we've 
been warned that inflation's coming. It's never really reared its ugly head. However, we are starting to see, um, you know, wage inflation. And so if it really makes its way to the, um, uh, if it makes its way to the consumer, that's, that's where we're going to start to see the market take notice. Um, you know, and, and if it comes in weaker than expected, you know, if you're looking at the S and P right now and, and I, I'm, I'm, I've been, you know, sitting here watching this, this recovery, I mean, we're probably heading back up towards, you know, 2,700 if the inflation number is weak. And, uh, and, and, and my, you know, what I'm trying to figure out is what I'm going to do, um, what I'm going to do if inflation comes in a little weak. Like, I know what I'm going to do if inflation comes in strong. I mean, if inflation comes in strong, I'm just going to probably sell some Aussie, sell some Kiwi, maybe even buy some dollar Canadian, um, buy some yen, uh, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, you know, risk off is easy. Um, it, like, it's it's very easy to, to identify what to do if stocks come down. Um, if, excuse me for yawning. I, I got up in the middle of the night and had a hard time getting back to sleep. Um, but if if uh, if you know we see stocks move higher, you know we see stocks, um, you know the the S and P move up. I'm not really too sure what to do in that situation. Um, you, you know, I'm I'm assuming. Uh, the euro, uh, which by the way hit the 618, are really damn close. And which this is so irritating to me. I had an order to sell the euro dollar last night at 123.99 uh, because I wanted to get in before the 618. We hit 91, I think, is our high. Yeah. 92. And obviously, it missed my order. I was so irritated. I got up this morning. I'm like, yeah, I might have got hit. And then I looked at the high, and I'm like, oh, I didn't get hit. I was so irritated. But um, um, it, it, you, love, don't, you love your work, man. I did. You know, I it's it's uh well. I mean, I had a great night last night. So uh, you know, I can I can I'll, I'll talk yeah. about that here in a moment. Um, uh, but when I it's like when golf, I, Blake, you know, you're on in two and you three putt. You're right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love hate relationship that I have with golf is is probably about as true as it is it rings with this, with the market. Well, I had a, a friend of mine, Blake. He got up to the tee and he swung and he missed two or three times. And he turned around <laughs> and he looked at me and said, "And I pay for this?" <laughs> trading. You know, I, I'm happy to I'm happy to report I'm I I. I don't and haven't for years probably will next my next outing i don't miss off the tee i don't yeah. i my my muscle memory is good enough with my golf game that i hit the ball every time it's just whether i hit the ball straight or not um so i'm i'm past that point thank god uh but 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 with uh with the the euro dollar um the this is going to be really critical here at the 124 level and, and 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 if you if you if you you know if you use forex analytics, I mean, I even wrote it last night. I mean, here's our basic technical analysis page. Last night, I wrote um, uh, the euro dollar bounced to the uh, fifty percent retrace. Oh, I put five hundred and nine percent retracement. I meant fifty percent. Fifty percent retracement thus far, and the bullish trend is trying to continue higher, but expect the one twenty four level to offer some key resistance for bulls. Um, and then there was a, there was an update this morning, um, in European trade, but, but as you can see, we came really close and then reversed. If you guys were, you know, if you guys were paying close attention in European trade, maybe you, you, you got a piece of that on that reversal. I, I, you know, obviously was sleeping at the time, so I didn't get it. But anyway, I, I think this is going to be critical. However, On a weak number, if we have a weak CPI number, um, you know, we're, we should blast through 124 and probably retest these highs. That 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 would be my assumption. Um, because again, I'm trying to just figure out, trying to figure out what I want to do if there's a weak a weak data print. Uh, uh, you know, there is a currency pair that has not acted very well. So if we do see a strong a strong um, uh, inflation 
print uh, strong CPI uh, on the core, then the pound should probably really come under pressure. The pound has had a very difficult time recovering as of late. Um, this is one of those currency pairs that I think a lot of people are were sucked in long. And, um, you know, on the break above 138.50, you know, as we as we came back up through here, okay, a lot of people sucked in long. And I think a lot of stops are, 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 are down here below these lows. And so if the dollar does rally on a strong inflation, inflationary print, I think that the uh, the pound could really come under pressure. It's one of those that I, I'm, I am keeping an eye on and I, I traded it. To the short side yesterday, uh, right during this during this webinar, I shorted it at uh, at 139, and I covered it yesterday at like 138.60 something when when we were on live yesterday, like 24 hours ago. I, I I think I even mentioned it while I'm on the I was on the webinar when I first jumped on. I said, hey, I'm going to cover the short. I had picked up like 30 or 40 pips on the short side yesterday, right here. I still wouldn't mind trading the pound to the short side if the dollar strengthens today. Um, that that would be a potential trade. The ones that I really want to uh, target, though, I think are the Aussie on a strong data print and the Kiwi because the Kiwi is, uh, you know, we rejected the 618 overnight and we're in this nice little up channel. So, you know, we break through the up channel here and the Kiwi's probably got a lot of uh, downside in it, in my opinion. Um, you know, another currency that's held up really well is the Canadian. I, I've, I've, I've watched a lot of guys and gals in our chat room. Um, and, 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 and guys, if you, uh, want to say hello really quick, this is our, this is our, uh, this is our chat room. Um, you can see, uh, there's about a hundred people in here right now. We're all very active in here. Um, and, uh, you guys are all on Jumbotron. There's Joe and Nidish and Kareem and Paul and uh, Hassan, Greg, Fernando, <laughs> Eric, I'm going to start missing people. There's Amanda. Anyway, um, we're, we're pretty active in here and I've seen a lot of our traders um, selling the US dollar Canadian over the course of the last, um, over the course of the last couple of uh, uh, days. You know, they've, they've, they've been shorting and I, I'm going to get rid of you guys really quick. I'm going to put you, put you Another back. great source of intelligence gathering in there, Blake. Oh, we have so many great traders here. Dang it. I'm trying to move my, hold on. I'm, I'm going to have to move it this, move back I've to where it was. comments from people about how much they've learned, even if they're not active in the room, just watching uh, the different charts that come up and everything. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a, there, there's, there, there's, there's so many really good traders in there and there's so many, um, there's just so many people and we have really great conversations. Everybody's very cordial and, you know, we're very all supportive of each other, which I love about our community. I'm, I'm very, um, very pleased with the people that are in there and we, we just don't tolerate anything but that. So, um, but uh, I, I've seen a lot of people going back to the dollar Canadian, a lot of people shorting the dollar Canadian and, and, you know, um, it's been a frustrating trade. You know, a lot of people are like, Hey, I'm short in the dollar Canadian here at 129 or 126 and change. And, you know, even though they might, you know, cover, make 10 or 15 pips. If you look at, if you look at the dollar Canadian, I, I have to admit this, this pair right here, it, it, it's not going down. Now that doesn't mean it's not going to go down, but if the dollar does strengthen, if we see uh, the dollar, you know, take off from here, this dollar Canadian is going to break. It's going to break higher. And, and, and so this is one of those that, that if, if, if we do see some dollar strength today, I think the dollar Canadian can really, can really move higher. And I've, I've played the dollar Canadian two weeks ago. I bought it down here when it came out of this descending wedge. We, we even had a pattern in play. Uh, if I, if I remember correctly, um, yeah, we had a pattern in play right here. Okay, uh, as as it broke through that descending wedge, you can see descending wedge, um, and and um, when we broke out of that, I played it to the long side, and it's been resilient. I I haven't traded it much since then. Uh, I am shorting the Canadian yen, but 
this thing is really resilient and and I'm, I'm my assumption is if we break these highs we're going a lot higher we're gonna start screaming remember the dollar Canadian has been outpacing other dollar pairs okay um, it has been really outpacing all the other dollar pairs as of late I mentioned to you guys a couple of weeks ago if we see any dollar strength we're gonna see it come through the dollar Canadian first and we did and and so and I still believe that I still believe that the dollar Canadian is resilient considering the what the rest of the dollar is doing I mean if you look at the dollar what happened yesterday the dollar got smeared yesterday got crushed right dollar index came down what the dollar Canadian do nothing not a thing so if the dollar does bounce this dollar Canadian should be a lot stronger now um, one other thing I want to mention. Okay, so the dollar yen. I was short the dollar yen last night. I, I was at my son's soccer practice and I saw this move last night. Last night I saw this move. Okay, we rallied above these highs and we failed. And and I and I turned around at practice. I actually was sitting in the park and I looked at the dollar yen and I said, man, that thing reversed all the way back to lows. It was lows in Asia. And it was at 107.70, and I shorted it at 69. Okay, I, 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 I sold dollar yen. I closed dollar yen when we got down to 107 and change last night. Um, and then I closed out my euro yen as we, we pushed down to this new low, and I closed out some of my Canadian yen too. I took some really good profits last night. Um, I, and, and I'm looking at the dollar yen, and if you wanna know why I'm targeting the dollar yen is because we closed outside of the multi-year trend line. Okay, we closed lower. Now, we didn't break the support yet as of last night, but you know, as I, wrote here for our analysis yesterday evening um the us dollar japanese yen is testing some very key support uh oh no end of day the dollar yen recovery the last couple of weeks only managed a 38 percent retracement today we closed below the multi-year trend line which is now at risk of a much deeper pullback a move below the 103 low 107 30 level would confirm the bearish uh, move now risk is for a move lower so that was you know my analysis from yesterday and and I told everybody in the chat room I'm like listen if we get a rally to 108 I'm gonna short it last night when I was at the park we went to 10790 whatever uh, 10790 and then reversed I'm like that was close enough and that's why I turned around and shorted it last night while I was at the park so look the the the, the dollar yen is at risk of a, a move lower um, and and if the inflation data is strong, okay, the inflation data is strong, like C CPI comes in at 0.3%, your gut reaction would be, I'm going to buy dollars, but dollar yen should not be in that equation. So let me say that again. If the inflation data comes in strong, the inflation data comes in strong, the gut instinct is to buy dollars. Dollar yen is not where you're going to want to be. Okay, you're going to want to be in euro or Aussie or Kiwi or something else, because if it's a strong CPI data number print, risk off is going to happen more than likely. And if that happens, the yen is going to strengthen. And I think the yen is going to be way more powerful than the than than the dollar. So so. If, if it's a strong data print, the dollar yen spikes up a little bit, you probably want to sell into that strength. That, that, that's my, you know, that, that's my two cents with the dollar yen. Um, and that's the way I'm going to trade it. If I can, if, if I can get, uh, if we get a strong, uh, CPI print and the dollar yen spikes up 20, 30 pips, I'm just going to sell right into that strength. So with that being said, I have to get ready for this CPI data. Um, I'm going to pass it over to my colleagues Steve and Stelios and back over to Dale uh, good morning guys how are you hey Blake good morning good, good morning Steve been, good, good, luck good luck today Blake thank thank you Dale um, uh, I'm, I'm good I just uh, just got to get ready for today it's gonna be a it's gonna be a big big data print today what do you what are you thinking Steve uh, extremely Critical. There is no question about it. I think the the whole market is waiting for it, and I think that if we get something 
that is going to be quite unexpected, especially if it's, uh, you know, hot. I think that uh, that can can easily influence uh, the uh, trading conditions for at least uh, the upcoming month. So, you know, we might see some more prolonged uh, dollar rebound. Now, on the other hand, if it comes on the weak side, I think, you know, uh, obviously, once again, the, the risks for the dollar are for a move uh, to the downside. Yeah. Uh, at least until we get something uh, newer or we start seeing like Powell and, you know, what he wants to bring to the Fed, uh, etc. Um, but I do think that uh, today's print uh, is going to influence both risk and, and the dollar. So, you know, quite a high chance of seeing uh, volatility uh, come back to us, you know, after the last week and what we had. I think the, the, the main reason that the markets have quite down is uh, because of, you know, expecting the CPI. All right. All right. All right. Well, Steve, thank you so much. And uh, guys, good luck today. Um, and uh, uh, we have best of luck. Thank you. And I'm going to pass it over to you. Bye-bye, mate. Bye -bye. Hey, Steve, great call in Aussie Kiwi on uh, yesterday's negative bar. Big follow-through to the downside. Um, if anyone took that call and sold that breakdown, would you tell them to cover, book some profits ahead of the CPI here on Aussie Kiwi shorts? No, the US CPI should play absolutely no role. Okay. All right. Cross currency pair that should Anyway, great. Well, what a classic pattern back to the neckline and fail. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, it, it was textbook. Yeah. And, you know, this consolidation was also textbook. And, you know, what else was textbook? Uh, was the was the price action we got uh, on 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 the eight, on the eighth of eighth of the month? I even remember somebody in the chat room mentioned like, "Oh my God, you know the Aussie Kiwi uh, falsely broke uh, below, and now it's 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 going to be bullish and break to the upside." Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, as I've said plenty of times, this is the reason I don't care about what's happening intraday. Usually, you know what I mean. Yeah, you're because, a big daily guy. Yeah, yeah and, because yeah, yeah I think you, it pay for you to eliminate these big wicks in your analysis too. I've seen you like you know on flash crashes and metals, just avoid the wick because there was no hardly any price action in there, any volume. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And you know many times you know like, price action like this one. I mean a very bullish candle that turns to be like a very uh, long shooting star. Uh, is a very powerful signal to the opposite direction, right? So right. people were bullish intraday, like, oh my God, look at what it's doing, etc. And you know, then the sentiment was completely different once the day closed. And you know, that was one more confirmation that probably, you know, the pair wants to move lower. It's currently breaking the next support zone. It's about to test the 61.8 uh, from this rally here. If it actually breaks down from there as well, I think there is a lot more downside. Uh, coming. So, you know, what we said still applies. Aussie is the preferred short uh, if you want to be short against uh, uh, instead of Kiwi. And, you know, if for some reason you want to be long one of these two commodity uh, currencies, you would better go with uh, Kiwi uh, as long as we stay below the 200 DMA here and the 1085 zone. Anyhow, uh, now ahead of the CPI, uh, Blake mentioned USD card. USD card seems to be in a triangle. That's a very you know, usual behavior uh, when there is a strong print that can affect the market that's coming. Um, you know, from a technical perspective, usually triangles break to the direction of the trend. But of course, you know, I'm not the kind of person that is trying to predict what a print is going to be by reading through the technicals, right? I mean, I, I'm not implying that having a triangle here predicts that we're going to have a strong CPI print. I'm just saying, you know, that from a technical perspective, it's more natural to expect a move to the upside. Um, but, you know, ahead of the CPI, anything can happen. Um, as, as Blake said, and we, we, sh we should have the number come out, we, we expect both CPI to come out and retail sales. Both of them are important prints, but especially the CPI, because we know that the Fed has been using the weak inflation as the only remaining reason for them to be not to be tightening, you know, uh, faster than expected. So. Let's see what we're going to get. USD yen is obviously also one to watch. The reaction here is going to be uh, telling. Um, but as we said yesterday and Blake mentioned today again, it's very important to see what's going to happen because if uh, if a strong CPI also brings up, oh, there we go. 
UCPI January uh, 0.5 versus 0.3, strong CPI. Let's see what else. Uh, US D consumer price index year on year, 2.1 versus expected 1.9. Yep, we got a strong one. We got a strong one. Let's see what what's happening across the board. USD CAD is, is trying to break to the upside. We were just saying about this triangle. Uh, Euro USD is, is showing some weakness, so we might get that possibility of head and shoulder formation. Of course, you know, we need to see more of a reaction. Uh, so I repeat, uh, 0 0.5 versus 0 0.3 expected month on month, with previous being 0 0.1. Year on year is 2.1 versus 1.9 expected. I remind you that the Fed's target is uh, you know, around 2%, like, you know, below, uh, a little bit below or at around 2%. So, you know, this is definitely another thing that comes on target for uh, the Fed. Um, X food and energy month on, on month, uh, I think this is what we call the core core CPI. It's 0 0.3 versus 0 0.2. Uh, the year on year on that is 1.8 versus 1.7. So even the core core is... Uh, um, you know, uh, a little bit hotter than expected. Uh, whoop. Big and reversal uh, on S&Ps, too, from uh, uh, yeah, yeah, 15 yeah. higher to 19 lower. And here it is. We're about to get some very nice follow-through. By the way, I forgot to mention that I got triggered uh, today. I got triggered short the Aussie. Uh, I had an order to go short at uh, 78.90. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I might have actually top-ticked it. It, it. it was a little bit of, of a risk. So far, in the, the Aussie shows a, an evening star formation here, which is really good. Let's see the Kiwi. Look at look at the week at the, on the Kiwi. It's, it still hasn't turned negative on the day, but look at this week. It's, it's, it's looking very nice. Now, having to do with the USD uh, yen, as you see, the USD yen is not responding that much. The reason being is that, uh, in my opinion, we said yesterday as well, there is a very good chance that we're going to see some strong, um, some risk aversion coming through to the market. Look at, look at the S&P. It's already rolling over, right? Uh, simply because this move should, should get yields strengthening once again. Let's have a fast look at what the 10-year uh, is doing. There it is. Already yeah, negative. Not even at new lows yet. That looks like a no, fade coming up here. No, it isn't. But look how heavy they are. I mean, look at this price action, right? Does this look look like to you something like something that wants to rebound? Because I it looks be short like down here. I wouldn't be short down here anymore. Consensus is two one way, and uh, I, I agree with you. Positioning is one one sided, but seeing a strong CPI. There we go. We, we got a jump at the yield currently almost at 2.9 again. I'm just seeing a chart, another chart, sorry, in another screen. Um, and you know something? I it, 282. It, you have it at 290? It, almost, almost. Okay. I said almost. Um, you know, we, we have one more downside target here for the 10-year. Uh, it's the 161.8 at 120. No, this is not the yield, right? This is the bond itself. Right. Um, so, you know, uh, as it seems, there it is. There is the USD card, by the way, breaking the triangle to the upside. You see how how how, how often, you know, uh, technicals, uh, you know, are indicative. I mean, this, this was a textbook triangle here. Uh, seeing a break to the upside makes sense. You know, from a technical perspective, it makes sense. So seeing at least one more leg higher, likely it can be towards the 127.80. Uh, and who knows what happens from there? There it is. There, there is the bond about to break to new to new lows, as you see. Let's have a look at the DXY itself. There it is, a rebound from here. So for the time being, this this is almost now becoming an outside white candle. So if we assume that the DXY strength does not fade from here, uh, this is going to be a powerful candle that is going to tell us that we have at least one more, even if this is, this is simply a short-term corrective move, you know, we should see at least one more leg to the upside, right? Because simply if, if today's candle ends on, near the highs, this, this is going to be like, you know, A, right. B, C at the very, very, very least. So yeah. by keeping it to minimum expectations and nothing else. Yeah, that looks right. Um, it was either yeah. or. By the way, we, we, 
by the way, we were talking about the Kiwi before. Just look at it. Only five minutes later. This now has become an outside black candle uh, by, you know, no surprise, retesting a support resistance area we had already marked. Looks red. Um, looks red. Yeah. L looks, looks bad from here. I mean, uh, keeping minimum expectations once again, we should at least see one more leg to the downside from here, perhaps towards the 71 area. Okay. Of course, whatever I'm saying here is uh, based on the fact that we're not going to see a fast fade of, of, of what of the price action we're getting. My gut instinct tells me that we probably won't because the CPI number is what the market was expecting. And I do think that it's enough for the market to see some follow through. So my gut instinct tells me that this initial reaction is not going to be faded in this occasion. Um, now, as you see, Euro is also uh, pushing at the lows of the day, already in essence erased yesterday's price action. Um, and if we do get back down to this confluence of supports and we break below it, then we open more downside for the Euro. Um, more or less the same applies to the cable. The cable anyhow was looking uh, somewhat worse uh, than the Euro. Uh, but, you know, uh, if we get some follow through, then uh, a, a retest of the 136, 136, 30 uh, support resistance area is more or less inevitable. And that's going to be a very key uh, level for the market to hold. I mean, for the bulls actually to hold if, if they want to prove that uh, the cable remains, uh, um, you know, bullish despite uh, seeing some corrective price action. Um, so I do think that now the market is, has exactly what it needs uh, to, you know, to, to, to progress to, to repositioning. And definitely, definitely a strong CPI removes, uh, at least in theory, any remaining hesitation from part of the Fed of what they're supposed to do. Asset valuations are extremely high. Uh, unemployment rate is extremely low. Um, and now uh, inflation seems to be on target. So, you know, what, what, what is there left uh, for them to use an, as an excuse not to 10-year, uh, by, by the way, at the moment, 2.875. Uh, so I think that we might hit 2.9, uh, you know, uh, today. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. I mean, that's what we were waiting for. We weren't many times that a strong CPI uh, is probably going to open the door for more dollar strength. And I think it's a very, very dangerous proposition for somebody to be 288, by the way, the 10 year. Uh, it's a very dangerous proposition at the moment for um, uh, for somebody to try to, to at least immediately fade uh, dollar strength. Let's have a look at what's happening with the metals because that's actually quite, quite important. And guess what's happening with the metals? Boom, gold. First, it took people, you know, out of their positions, right? By rallying almost to uh, 1340 without any real reason ahead of the CPI. You know, these kind of moves, these kind of moves are honestly, uh, how can I say it? Suspicious, you know what I mean? Somebody is pushing, uh, you know, uh, short positions, out of the market just before a CPI print, you know, in something that is definitely going to be affected. I mean, gold is directly correlated to real yields. Real yields are, yields are obviously are also directly co correlated to nominal yields. And, you know, with today's CPI print, we would definitely get a move uh, unless it was completely as expected. So, uh, you know, that, that move was com very suspicious and we're already cool. seeing an out outside black candle. I think that, uh, you know, now the chances for gold to resume and at least retest the 1300 area uh, have increased significantly. Let's have a look of uh, what silver is doing. There it is. Silver is also rolling over. Silver didn't actually follow through as much as gold did. I mean, it never managed to even surpass a single resistance zone. It, it, it bumped its head on, the, um, on this support resistance area and the 50 DMA that's exactly there. Uh, it, it's about to register an evening star formation here. So I think that, as I said, uh, metals should remain bearish uh, in uh, uh, in the short term. Um, I, I, by the way, I'm also um, uh, now uh, short some palladium again. Um, since yesterday, I also wrote it in the chat room. Um, we might get some follow through here. 
as well. Like Palladium was, you know, retesting the 1,000 areas resistance. I think there is a good chance, you know, to see some uh, some follow through there as well. Um, okay, let's see if we got any real follow through in anything else. No, more or less, it's exactly as we left it a few minutes ago. Uh, let's have a look at the 10-year yield. There it is. As you see, it's about to break to new highs, right? This was definitely, this is definitely more or less a, a bullish formation, right? So very likely to see at least or one more. more could end up being an ending diagonal. Even if it is to end uh, to 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 be an ending diagonal, which yes, you're absolutely right with that. It can be. I would still expect one more yeah. push to the upside, R right? Yeah. Yeah. And it won't, exactly. And it won't be confirmed by the RSI either. Yes, even exactly. Exactly. So, so, yeah, for the Short for the time, it's even more glaring. Put up a four hour on that. There you go. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll confirm up there. Yeah. We'll see. Nice. We'll see. Yeah, I love your charts, man. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, let's let's go back to the USD yen. When I grow up, I I want to be a a great chartist like you. And <laughs> and by the way, uh, Blake said it today. I said it yesterday. We said don't try to play. USD strength if we get a strong CPI through the USD yen, because likely the USD yen is going to is going to start following risk, and risk is not going to like. I repeat, is not going to like a strong CPI print, because don't forget that the trigger anyhow for uh, risk to go off was the jitters that increased and accelerating. Uh, yields uh, uh, brought to the market, right? So obviously, strong CPI print does not help in that direction, and it should at least temporarily have another negative effect to to risk. And that's what we're seeing so far. Um, so the indices have already moved lower, but we need to see what kind of follow through we're going to get. The, the market seems to be rethinking a little bit about it. It's it's consolidating the. Uh, the, the dollar uh, gains, but honestly, I'm going to say it again, and I'm, you know, I'm going to risk an, an assessment. I don't really see a very strong reason for the market not to at least produce some follow through to dollar strength, right? With risk, you can never be very sure because this is a very bullish market overall. It hasn't been lately, obviously, but having to do with the dollar, you know, I can't really find a reason why somebody's going to be trying to fade today dollar strength. I mean. We definitely, definitely got an extra element that can add somewhat to uh, the Fed's recent hawking, hawkiness. We, you, can, you can tell them hawkish, but they, they're definitely leaning that way in comparison to, to, to the past, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's very dangerous trying to, to, to fade this. Anyhow, uh, you know, we have plenty of hours. I think within the next couple of hours, we're going to get a better idea. Uh, but definitely the initial reaction is exactly what you should be expecting. And now I think we can go over some of the questions and see, uh, you know, what, what people want to um, ask, etc. At the same time, of course, we will keep monitoring what's happening in the markets. And we're going to see in the remaining 17 minutes we have if something changes. Now, let me go through some questions. Uh, previously the user following is P direction. Today spike is opposite. Do you expect the correction, the correlation to return USD, JPY go down with S and P down? Yes, Steve. Uh, we've already seen this correlation uh, come back in life somewhat during the past several days, and we had warned about it. That keep in mind that if we see some, we had warned about it uh, even even when the indices were at the highs with full euphoria there, we said that keep in mind that if risk off comes back in force at some point, expect the USD yen to be following uh, its usual correlation a lot more than, than it has in the recent past. And we've already seen that happen. So yeah, definitely, definitely. And you know something else? Let's have a look. You know, you didn't ask about it, but I'm going to tell you something. This is the Nikkei. 
and the Nikkei is at a very, very dangerous position. Why is that? Simply because we are now trading below the 200 DMA. You can see it here. We, we also seem to be penetrating very serious or to be attempting to penetrate through very serious support areas. Uh, we're currently testing the highs that we had in 2015, in the summer of 2015, uh, which, you know, which was a double top, a very, very important area. Um, also, this trend line, uh, we're penetrating through it, through it, and we're about to test this ascending trend line as well of, of that wedge. Um, so, honestly, especially if the Nikkei uh, actually shows some follow through to the downside from here, then things become very tough with the Nikkei as well. So, this is another element that can, can bring some, some pressure to uh, to the yen because you know um, one feeds the other. I mean, a weaker yen uh, brings a bit to uh, the Nikkei, or a stronger yen, uh, uh, you know, weakens the Nikkei. But on the other hand, also some risk of in the Nikkei can bring uh, yen strength. So one feeds the other, right? So um, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. And I have to tell you something that if we end up uh, closing below 1073. We, we were trading below it anyhow. We were trading below it, you know, several hours ago. Uh, you know, that means that we've broken to new, let me see, uh, 13, 13, 14 month lows, which is never a good thing. And I don't really see any serious area of support until 105.70. So that's another like 150 pips from here. So definitely not good. We had already warned that this this year was 100% um, a formation that uh, should produce follow through in the direction of the previous trend. That's what happened. And you know, once we break below here, then I think inevitably we're going there. So another 150 pips, you know, <laughs> it's something. And who knows what happens from there? I mean, you know, one step at a time. Um, okay, let's go back to having a look at the SPX. Okay, we're not seeing any serious follow through. Of course, the initial reactions, which were quite strong, are holding. So the dollar is uh, against most currency pairs at the moment, uh, almost at the highs, almost, not exactly, but almost at the highs. It has done a little bit of a retracement. And the risk is almost at the lows of the day. And, you know, usually if you are to see a snapback and a huge reversal, like, you know, an initial reaction that is, in, that is going to be immediately faded, usually it should have already happened, which tells me that this, uh, you know, consolidation that we're seeing here is probably going to produce more follow through to the direction of the initial move. Okay, so be very careful. Uh, if, if you're trying to be, uh, you know, uh, short the dollar or uh, long risk. My pleasure, Steve. My pleasure. Um, okay, let's have a look at oil, by the way. I know that you mentioned oil earlier, Dale. Um, you know, I had said plenty of times that 58 was sufficient as a downside target. But on the other hand, when we reached 58 so fast, I repeated that yesterday as well. I said that, listen, you know, something needs to correct both in time and in price. And, you know, a correction in price to 58, you know, could have been sufficient, but not, uh, it's not sufficient in time because it happened too fast, which tells me that probably uh, crude wants to correct even lower from here. And you, you, you see how heavy it is. And obviously, some dollar strength coming through the market, obviously, is not going to help it, obviously. Right. So be careful. I don't think you should be uh, trying to bottom pick this yet. I think it's somewhat too early, by the way. Uh, something else I want to stress, um, the DAX. Let me show the DAX. The DAX is once again at the lows. Let's see if it's going to be sufficiently supported by euro weakness, since we, we, we're seeing euro USD obviously weaken somewhat due to dollar strengthening. But I have to tell you that, you know, if we manage to close below this zone as well, the 1,200, 12, 
then we're definitely headed to another important area, which is the 11,800. Uh, so we're more or less headed 300 handles lower if we actually fail from here. Okay, in general, as long as we're holding below 12,600, uh, I think that you have no reason to uh, to be trying to, to, to belong the index. Okay. S&P already more than 1% lower on the day. I'm guessing that the Dow is going to open, uh, you know, around there as well. NASDAQ, more or less the same, 1.2% lower. Uh, the fun part is that suddenly we got volatility increase. So what looks like a, a rather small candle today is a 1.2% move, which in the recent past was considered like a, you know, a huge move. But now uh, the ATR has expanded so much and volatility has expanded so much that a 1.2% move after what, we, what we've seen during the past couple of weeks seems like a, you know, a negligible move and it isn't. Uh, but as I said, and I said it, you know, quite some time ago, I really believe that now that volatility has come back in force in the market, I would, um, you know, I would really uh, not be looking for it to drop down again to the levels it was. I think that we might be entering an, an, an era that volatility is going to remain elevated, even if we end up eventually moving higher from here which to me is another telltale sign that this uh, bullish cycle is closer, it's much closer to the end than many expect. And I'm not ruling out, as I said, a push to new highs eventually after you know things quiet down, but I would really not be looking once again for volatility to go back at the eight handle, low nine handles, and remain there for a prolonged period of time. I think that, you know, what we got at, uh, you know, at, at, at the beginning of, um, at the end of January and at the beginning of February um, is probably a shift, uh, you know, to, 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 a, to a new market condition, okay? So, um, you know, at, at least this, this, this is how I interpret it and, you know, this is how I expected it to happen sooner rather than later. Let's have a look at gold again, see what it's doing. Okay, it has paid back some of the losses, but still this candle remains, you know, an ugly one if you're bullish. Uh, let's have a look at USD CAD. Okay, it's actually above the triangle. 126.60 remains, of course, the first area of resistance. Uh, a, a daily close above it opens uh, 127.80. So 120 pips to the upside. If we confirm a daily close above the, here the confluence of these ranges, previous support, and the 61.8 from the highs, from the recent highs, I mean. Um, by the way, I wanted to, I wanted to mention Cadian before. Uh, listen, Cadian has been extremely bullish, uh, extremely bearish lately because it has actually confirmed the double top. Uh, but keep in mind that it's currently testing, uh, after this last push that we got now, it's currently testing some uh, quite major support area. Let's also see if that's a bigger FIB to the market. Let's see. Yeah, it's also the 61.8 uh, from that move higher. So, you know, be careful because this area can at least produce you know, some, some reaction. If we actually slice through this area, it's going to be an extremely bearish sign because, you know, this is, a dub, this is a nice confluence of supports. So if the market completely ignores it, you know, then you, you, you need to be, uh, you know, even more skeptical about what's going to happen to this market because, you know, if it's that weak to slice through here, I think that, uh, you know, then it might be a matter of time to be testing the lows here, which is, you know, like it's an area uh, like 400 pips lower from here. So be, you know, be very careful. I think, you know, it's very important to see what's, how the market is going to react uh, to that confluence. 
Uh, okay, dollar seems to be pushing once again uh, since the Kiwi is, is once again at the lows. Let's have a look at the Aussie once again. Whoa, the Aussie is once again, you know, reacting to weakness more than the Kiwi is. There you go. Okay. Should gold move higher with higher inflation? Um, yeah, uh, depends. Gold responds to real yields. So, in essence, gold is highly correlated to uh, um, not to nom not to nominal inflation, but to what you know the, the differential of inflation to, uh, to to yields okay so it depends on what happens with yields but in general in general uh given that there is also a correlation there yes yes gold responds positively to inflation okay phenomenal move in the euros let's have a look at it yep you know something uh grega said it I said it as well some time ago, between all the cross currencies, the euro Aussie was the one looking the best because this was obviously either a triangle or a bull flag and it ended up being a bull flag because we got an incremental new low there. So that ended up being a bull flag initially. I was monitoring it as a, as a possible triangle and we're currently pushing above uh, this flag. So yeah, I think follow through is coming here. We're, we're already, by the way, at new highs. So, yeah, follow through is coming here. And I think uh, that an expectation that we might get a push to the 161.8 of the recent corrective move, which is like a golden fib, which is at 161.50, uh, roughly 340 pips higher from here. It, it's, a, it's a doable target. Pretty it's a doable target. Dixie. Pretty good fade in the Dixie. Nice tail. So uh, we're going to know by the close, if, if the dollar can't rally on news like this and it fails from here, look out dollar, in my humble opinion. Yeah, the absolutely. Sale. The daily close today, the daily close today is going to be important. But for the time being, we do see some dollar strength and, you know, there is a chance, there is a good chance that we're going to see some follow through. Uh, as I said, the market, from a fundamental perspective, has no reason not to not to in interpret this inflation data as uh, um, um, you know as dollar positive because they should they should um, enhance the ability of the Fed to be more hawkish. Okay, they they have completely run out of excuses to be dovish now. Yeah, I'm just saying. Uh, look at the one-hour candle. And someone sold the dollar on that pop. Yep, they did indeed. But for the time being, as I said, another at least one more leg to the upside, even as part of a little correction, um, is a very high probability scenario, in my opinion. A very high probability scenario. Uh, I'm actually, markets, man. I'm actually de definitely, I'm actually short uh, at the moment that dollar against the Aussie, uh, I mean, long the, do the dollar against the Aussie, sorry, I'm short the Aussie uh, USD and it looks quite good. You know, I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Now, yeah, I, like, I like your trade selection on that. Yeah, I, I, had, I, had, I, had, I had, exactly, I had said many, many times. And if you remember, and I know that you, you, know, that you have an amazing memory, Dale, you remember how many months ago I said, it was definitely last year, that listen, we're coming in a period that I do not think that we're going to be seeing dollar weakness anymore across the board, right? right, right. I think that there are going to be opportunities to be both long and short the dollar from this point on. I do. And we've seen that, that since then, right? That's been true. We, yeah. You have to differentiate, you know, unless you're just trading yeah. the Dixie. You know, there's differentiation going on, unlike absolutely. the stock market where everything goes up and down together. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Anyhow, this is going to be an interesting day. 
Uh, we're going to keep you up to date with uh, constant updates in Forex Analytics yeah. and, of course, Give me, a minute. Give me one more minute, Steve, okay? Absolutely. And with this, and I'll start with David. Absolutely. And discussion in the chat room. I think that, you know, uh, today's daily closes are going to be very indicative of, of what might follow through for the rest, at least for the rest of this month. Um, so, you know, um, stick with us and I'm sure that, uh, you know, there's, 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 there are going to be very interesting trading opportunities. I mean, th this kind of an environment with increased um, vertices, USD knock, by the way, we mentioned yesterday that this is a key area for the USD knock and it can uh, potentially, you know, produce another leg to the upside. Um, and you see it found support here. Uh, so, you know, another push to the upside is likely. Um, I, I, I want to be short the USD knock absolutely once again. Uh, you know, I, I, I've made good money the past couple of years uh, and I'm always trading USD knock to the downside simply because my macro thesis is that it should be moving to the downside eventually. So, you know, I, I feel a lot more comfortable holding it short than holding it long. So usually I'm just monitoring uh, rebounds and, and, and selling them instead of trying to trade it both ways. Um, okay, I'm ready. Okay, so who do we have in for an interview today, Dave? Uh, a great interview with David Brady at Global Pro Trader. Okay, and, perfect. And, and David has uh, some very strong views about what's happened here in the last few weeks. So with that Okay, being I'm said, looking forward great, to, to hearing it. Yeah, great analysis like usual, Steve. You want you go through the you cover the board like no one else I know. So uh, okay, David, I'm going to make you the presenter now, passing you the baton. Really looking for forward to uh, speaking with you because I know you have some conviction about what's happening. Okay, Dale, can you hear me? I can, David. Welcome back to Face. Hey, thanks for having me back on, Dale. Yeah, you know, uh, I follow you on Twitter a lot, David, and uh, you provide a lot of uh, real interesting comments and content, and I was excited to invite you back, and uh, even the timing's great because uh, you actually use the word, let's get right to it, that you think we're entering a crisis. So um, I'm interested uh, uh, in what your reasons are and, you know, what you believe uh, are asset classes that we could take advantage of it and avoid. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, given the time uh, allotted, Dale, I won't get into the specifics of why this is why I uh, this crisis is about to occur. Uh, you know, we can talk debt mountains, budget deficits, etc. Uh, I will get into uh, real time discussion about why I think the financial crisis has already begun. Okay. Um, and let me take a guess. Is it led by a sovereign debt crisis? Uh, yes, it's 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 led by the sovereign. It's by higher bond yields, a drop in stocks, drop in the dollar. Uh, we'll get into the details, but I, I do want to segue into the data this morning because it it you know it segues really well with the discussion we're about to have. So the CPI is higher than expected. You know, higher inflation, higher yields, higher higher dollar. But for me, uh, deflation is a lagging indicator. Uh, retail sales were awful. Uh, the headline was minus 0.3%, the core flat. That's way lower than expected. And yet the dollar goes up, yields go up, gold, silver, platinum, the precious metals all go down, and stocks get hammered again. So, uh, you know, we can't trust the first move, uh, but this move only makes sense to the extent that markets are truly scared that the Fed no longer has its back and rate hikes and balance sheet reduction continues as planned. Okay. So, uh, and by the way, uh, this also shows that the market knows that the Fed care, could care less about the economy because you know, if retail sales are weak, that's a better leading indicator of inflation going forward. Consumption in the US economy is a better le leading indicator of inflation going forward than a retrospective uh, piece of data like the CPI. So to me, the, the market reaction shows that uh, the market is well aware that the Fed is less concerned about the economy, but more concerned about getting rates uh, as high as possible, as fast as possible, and uh, reducing their balance sheet as soon as possible, per the plan they laid out in September. 
uh, in order to have ammunition for the recession and the market downturn that's about to occur. So, you know, let's discuss why I believe that, you know, our financial crisis has begun. We're having our Bear Stearns moment right now, I call it. We'll use the 2007-2008 uh, crisis as, uh, a, a, you know, a reference point, if you will. Um, in times of crisis, fundamentals tend to take over. They take on more importance than technical sentiment, positioning, and other forms of analysis, in my opinion. Um, and when I say fundamentals, I mean central bank policies, and specifically those of the Fed. Uh, the Fed and global central uh, bank policies have dominated the markets for years. You know, stocks, bonds, foreign exchange, yes. uh, commodities, the lot. Uh, I believe we're undergoing a sea change in those policies, at least in the US, by going from QE to QT. Uh, quantitative tightening uh, is the order of the day. The punch bowl has been taken away. Uh, and, you know, I want to... Uh, reference this article that Lee Adler posted on online on Saturday, basically stating that the Fed is intent on raising interest rates and reducing its balance sheet, as it outlined back in September. Uh, he called it the most drastic tightening of monetary policy in history. He pointed out that yields started to rise in September once the balance sheet reduction program was announced, as we can see here. Yes. Um, you know, the 10-year rose from 2.05% up to, this is a uh, day ago or so, so it's 2.86, but it's been as high as 2.89, I believe. But this is the highest level since 2014. Now, tax cuts, higher government spending uh, just ballooned the already, already huge budget deficit and requires Treasury to issue more debt, which means greater supply of bonds. This is at a time when the Fed is not rolling over much of its investments in US Treasuries anymore, and our biggest foreign buyers are purchasing less. This means yeah. less demand for bonds. So, okay, so uh, we're basically, rates could go up, yeah. not because of economic growth, but the Fed controls short rates, but long rates can go up because of more supply and less demand. Exactly, I was gonna say economics 101, more supply, less demand means higher, uh, lower prices, higher yields. So we could have higher yields without dramatically higher GDP. Yes. Got it. Absolutely. You know, the, the Fed, the, the yield curve was flattening for quite some time, and now all of a sudden we're getting a reversal. I do not believe the data that says that the U.S. economy is growing strongly. I know the mainstream media likes to cite that data point, and it points to government statistics uh, showing that. But... You know, one of the pieces of data that I like to look at that I feel is one of the least manipulated is the Federal Reserve, uh, sorry, the Federal Tax Receipts. And the Federal Reserve, uh, sorry, Federal Tax Receipts, they've been in and out of recession, uh, showed us to be in and out of recession since 2016. And in other words, they've gone positive. I actually, I think I have the chart here somewhere so I can share okay. So uh, your your view of what's happening in the business world is how much Uncle Sam gets from everybody, corporations, individuals, et cetera. Um, could, could they be affected by, you know, tax evasion or uh, without repatriation, and now we're going to have repatriation? Could that increase tax receipts with the new tax law? You, I mean, that is part of the plan, I'm sure, but, I, you know, I'm not expecting a huge boon to tax receipts as a result of, uh, of the repatriation, personally. Yeah, I mean, in this recovery with what the stock market did and everything, that's uh, a pretty good decline from 2011 to where we are now. Yeah, and look, at, look back at what happened, you know, post yeah. the dot-com bust. Look what happened in 2008, 2009. It's a pretty reliable indicator of recession uh, or pending recession, and the trend is clearly down. That's very uh, interesting, David. Thanks. You know, I never looked at it that way. I learned something new from you today. I appreciate <laughs> it. Well, okay. you know, I mean, that's part of the reason, of course, you know, I'm a humanitarian and I want to edify other people. But, you know, I learn every day when I bring guys like you in here. So, that, you know, thank you for this pearl. Well, I appreciate that, you know, so I'm done. Uh, thanks for having me on, Dale, and uh, I'll speak to you next time. I'm just kidding. <laughs>
<laughs> it's been a pleasure, my friend. <laughs> my job is done. No, I, my point. My point is. Sorry to interrupt you, Dale. My point is that you know when you hear the mainstream media talking about how well the economy is doing and this justifies higher rates, you know I, I just don't buy it. And it's data like this which uh, reinforces my argument. I believe. Okay. Um, I, I believe that the uh, bond yields are going up basically due to supply and demand factors. Um, the short end is uh, going higher also uh, because inflationary expectations have increased. That has been driven by higher taxes, higher government spending, talk of a 1.5 trillion infrastructure plan, and not least a weaker dollar. It's been falling since January 2017. So, all are you looking for a continuation of that? I know some people are thinking maybe from lower levels we have a bear market rally, but uh, your uh, your your belief is that this downtrend in the dollar, uh, without you know. Uh, without uh, bear market rallies is headed down in a uh, fairly dramatic way? Yeah, I think it's headed down, yes. And, you know, uh, actually, I was going to start talking about the effect of these policies on stocks, as okay. we've seen. That's right. Um, and uh, why, you know, one of the uh, precursors to a financial crisis is an increased correlation between assets across the board. And I pointed this out on Twitter back in January that we were seeing heightened correlation, both direct and inverse, between the dollar, the S&P, bonds, oil, and gold. Across and crypto. And crypto. And, and crypto as well. Yeah, everything. And everything, this, everything was a balloon with a different amount of oxygen or helium in it. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. what, what this told me, based on experience with 2007 and you know 99, was that when you get increased correlations across asset classes that are usually uh, used for diversification purposes, in other words, that they uh, trade uh, differently to one another, yet they're either perfectly or uh, perfectly positive or per perfectly negatively in, uh, correlated to one another, that's a sign of trouble. And sure enough, here we are. Now, uh, stocks, and the reason I bring this up, is stocks are having a little bit of turmoil right now. It, to me, it's no big deal. The Fed has said it perfectly. You know, given where we've come from, this is a storm in a teacup. However, I, I don't believe it's going to get it's going to get better in the short term, but it's not going to get better down the road. I believe I call this the Bear Stearns moment for a reason because I believe the Lehman-like moment is coming. Okay, and, yeah. and that's later, that's later in the year. And one of the few tools or one of the few cushions for that blow uh, to, to stocks that will keep them propped up in the meantime is a weaker dollar. If they're green, you saw it in the past couple of days and you see it this morning. Well, you saw it all last year, right? Weaker dollar is a tailwind for uh, equities, commodities, and a stronger dollar is a headwind. Yeah, I, I just think it becomes clearer now, Dale, because we've got a two way market finally. In yeah. stocks again. Last year was a one-way market. Was it the dollar? Was it central bank stimulus? Was it blah blah blah? Okay. Now it's now that we got a two-way market in stocks again. You can clearly see that a higher dollar is negative for stocks. A weaker dollar is positive. And if you doubt it, just look at the the action of the past three days. This morning, what's the Dixie doing this morning? And what's the stocks doing? The Dixie is up. Stocks are down. And that's why I think that. I believe stocks are going to get a yields are going to come down. They're oversold and over uh, over bearish. Yields are going to have a rally here shortly. Uh, stocks are going to rally also, in my opinion. Uh, but it's going to be a temporary reprieve for what comes later this year. And so, a, so do you think that the big break later this year, David, in equities is going to be a comp accompanied by a dollar rally? Yes, I, I, it, typically, if you look back, you know, uh, 2008, the dollar benefits from capital inflows in times of crisis. Okay. For many reasons, I mean, it's you know, it's the dollar, but more importantly, uh, the U.S. market is the most liquid market in the world, and you know, emerging markets, uh, other investments abroad, tend to flow into the U.S. in times of crisis. Now, I think it'll be temporary, because the reaction uh, I expect from the Fed following that crisis will 
uh, weak in the dollar. And why do I think the markets are going to go back down again is a, a question I've received a lot. I think the markets are testing the new Fed share Powell. Uh, they want to, to find out where is the Fed put? Does it still exist? Where is it? And they're going to push markets down until the Fed relents, until the Fed reverses course and does a 180. And so, uh, David, again, I know I interrupt a yeah. lot, but there, but there, there are historical precedents for the markets testing Fed chairmen. Right, go back to Greenspan. He had the '87 crash upon him in a short yeah. period of time, and then you had Bernanke, who had the financial crisis uh, shortly yeah. after his uh, nomination and taking the chair. So yeah. uh, they're going to test Powell out too. Yeah, exactly. They knew Yellen had their back. This new guy walks in the door. Uh, we we want to know what. He's a lawyer. Sorry? He's a lawyer. He's a lawyer, yeah. <laughs> they, they want to know if the lawyer has their back. <laughs> <laughs> we know that's not, <laughs> we know yeah. that's not possible. Yeah, yeah that would be a lawyer that's had your back or your pocketbook. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, we had the bump in yields. Uh, it took a while for stocks to catch up. We're seeing that right now. Um, the inflation expectations have obviously popped as well. And that's one of the drivers of this weakness in stocks because they're expecting, you know, it justifies higher interest rates, uh, justifies the reduction in the balance sheet, etc. But I will, as Lee Adler pointed out, uh, the reduction of the balance sheet is critical. And as Jim Rickards, and Brandon Smith pointed out uh, you know, something that hasn't been reported in the mainstream media, but it was critical to the drop in stocks on that Friday post the FOMC, was the announcement that the Fed had cut their balance sheet by over 20 billion. Now, this wasn't a, a big number given it's 4 trillion balance sheet, but it was bigger than anything previous, and it showed that they were keeping to their plan uh, to cut the balance sheet, uh, the assets on their balance sheet, you know, 10 billion a month, now it's 20 billion a month, then it'll be 30 billion a month, then it goes up to 600 billion annually as a run rate uh, going forward. So if the Fed is going to keep to this, at the same time they're hiking interest rates, for stocks that are heavily reliant on QE, I would argue that QE is uh, central bank stimulus, is the primary reason for the stock market rally since 2009. Uh, we can debate that all day, but that's my belief. So, well, uh, exactly. It forced people to take risk because they were getting 0% to be a saver. So, you know, that's how we came up with Tina. There is no alternative but stocks. So, the Fed did that with repression, and savers got punished and risk takers got rewarded. True, and I would argue as well that the bonds that they purchased from the banks in that quantitative easing process, the primary dealers, etc., the, taking the toxic securities, those mortgage-backed securities off the bank's books, uh -huh. supplied the banks with a lot of cash, you know, two trillion plus, that sits on the Fed balance sheet as in, in interest on our excess reserves, which they're earning interest on, but they can use that cash to invest in something like the stock market. And, you know, it's well known that the Swiss National Bank and the Bank of Japan buy foreign assets. The Swiss National Bank publishes its data. But I do believe that the banks, the commercial banks themselves, have plowed money in because the correlation between the Fed's balance sheet and the stock market is, you know, some would say you can have spurious correlations. This one's too obvious to ignore. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I think taking the punch bowl away you don't even have to cut QE, you just have to stop it. And like any Ponzi scheme, and I'm going to use that term, uh, it collapses. You need increasing inflows for uh, a scheme such as this to be sustained. If you simply stop providing those funds, or worse, removing them, subtracting funds, the, the system collapses. And I think that's what's unfolding right now. The punch bowl has been taken away. As Lee pointed out, the Fed is intent on reducing its balance sheet. It's on autopilot. 
uh, their inflation expectations have soared, rate hikes uh, justifies not just three, but potentially more. Uh, you know, we've had a few Fed speakers come out and suggest that is indeed the case, that we're good on three, we may even do four. And this is spooking uh, stock investors. Yes. So, you know, David, wasn't there, uh, I remember reading, even when uh, the punch bowl was still being filled up, that uh, central planners were getting less bang for the buck as far as it being converted into growth. Uh, they weren't getting the same return on investment by continuing QE. Do you recall that? So that was already starting to happen before yes. they, yeah, okay. So, it, you know, it ends up not working anyway. What was their choice? Keep throwing uh, good money after something that's not working. All right, so uh, uh, go ahead uh, with your, uh, yes. that S&P chart, you know. Yeah, no, exactly, um, Dale. The, you know, I don't want to get into conspiracy theory, but these days conspiracy theory tends to turn out to be conspiracy fact. But uh, you, you're exactly correct. There were diminishing marginal returns on QE. So what does the Fed do? They know that their existing tools can't continue to prop up the market. Well, let's let some air out of the tire. Right. And you know, uh, when the next crisis occurs, this gives us the, I mean, or the excuse uh, to execute some pretty extreme measures in order to keep the boat afloat. And I think, to your point, that that is uh, something, that has something to do with what's happening right now. And Fed, you know, Chair Powell said on November 27th, we must be prepared to respond decisively and with appropriate force to new and unexpected threats to our nation's financial stability and economic prosperity. That's a strange statement to make when you've just been nominated for the job. I mean, like the world's falling apart. I thought everything was rosy. Um, this is a whatever it takes kind of statement that Draghi made uh, to support the euro and uh, EU sovereign debt. And it tells me that the next, when the next crisis occurs, which I believe is going to be later this year, the Lehman moment, as I call it, likely pre-midterm uh, elections, uh, the Fed will respond with the put, and they're going to respond in style. Uh, I, now, I could be wrong with this outlook, I'll be honest. We, we, we talked about it on a previous call back in May. I'll admit it, I, I don't know, but this is what I expect. They've always, responded with increasingly extreme measures. Well, given that this is the everything bubble, uh, when it starts to crack, they're going to want to respond or need to respond with extremely draconian measures. And, uh, well, draconian in the reverse, I'm sorry. And here we are, QE infinity, a, a physical cash ban, you need that in order to enable what's next. And uh, something I abhor is negative interest rates. You know, paying someone to lend them money. That's a great idea. So do you uh, think it was a test case for democracies, what Modi did in India? And that's why, and, and here we go, this could happen here with bail-ins and everything. So, you know, if you're stashing $100 bills, you have to go to lower denominations and you probably have to diversify out of the dollar before the fall. Is that what you're thinking here? Yeah, you, you nailed it, Dale. The India, the cash-based society, 95% of transactions were based on cash. If, so, if we can, if we can uh, implement a physical cash ban in India, it's going to yeah. work anyway. Yeah, I mean, there's more people there, and, you know, the country didn't melt. Uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of people suffered because it was cash and carry, a lot of cash and carry, but it's not as cash and carry here in the U.S. Everything's your debit, credit card. Anyway, and do you think they let Bitcoin and the whole crypto experiment happen so that the public embraced crypto and they would think it's really cool to have a federal cryptocurrency where they know everything we do? I, I, I think we are on the same page in more yeah. aspects than wow. I thought. You, you've been following my tweets. Yes. Uh, actually, I would go further and no, say we're that. just kindred spirits, David. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not Kreskin, I can't read your mind, but you know, I, I've been talking about these things for a while and they scare the hell out of me. So I, anyway. I don't, I don't believe in coincidence there. Yeah, uh, Providence. 
Yes, uh, I mean, we, <laughs> exactly. We talk about India. You could yeah. talk about Cyprus and Greece on the bail-ins uh, side. Yeah. Uh, you've got the Bitcoin uh, with regard to digital currencies. You've got Japan, etc., with regard to so Sweden, with regard to negative interest rates. The examples uh, are left, right, and center, and that's why I said when I shared this slide with a bunch of people, they were like, "Oh, that'll never happen in the U.S. Uh, that's impossible, really, because it's happening everywhere else." I mean, wealth tax, a wealth tax. Uh, you know, they're going to you know charge everybody you know five, ten percent on their wealth. You know, assets yeah. minus liabilities. That'll never happen. Oh, really? Uh, France and Switzerland and Italy all have versions of that right now. They're, they're not banana republics. So, uh, and each of these, we've done QE before, as you uh, pointed out, the, the cash, physical, large denomination bills were banned in India, and they are right. fine. Negative interest rates, Sweden, Japan, elsewhere, bail-in, Cyprus, Greece, uh, capital controls, they've been around forever. Asset seizures, well, you know, we, we've already seen some of that in the US, and then wealth taxes. I think Powell's going to unleash monetary insanity on the US economy. And you'll see some other similar uh, moves around the world, given the extent of the uh, downturn that's coming. And, you know, could I be wrong? Yes, but if you prepare for the maybe war- Maybe in the timing, maybe in the timing you could be wrong. Yeah. You know, because, you, yeah. you know, I follow some pretty good people and, uh, uh, you know, the one, one guy I have in mind, and even, you know, guys here called this correction in the market. But this one person I'm thinking of actually thinks the S&Ps make new highs and actually that the bull market in stocks is not over until uh, 2020 and about 4,200 in the S&P and then a generational bear market. Do you well, think, I, do you think I they can hold things together that long? Well, uh, actually, that's precisely my view. The, 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 you know, let, let me clarify. So then, these things, these things that you're talking about, um, will they happen? They won't happen during before we top. Do you think, or they happen on the crash that you show, starting mainly somewhere in 2019? Yeah. Uh, so you to, uh, I lay it out clearly. Um, this is the first nice moment we pop to a higher high of 3,000, 3,200, 300 this yeah. summer. Then okay. we drop in this crisis pre midterm elections, uh, make sure that the GOP gets wiped out. Trump gets the blame. That's yeah. going to be you know, later this year. And then the Fed responds and we get a nice rally up to a blow off top from 20, 2,000 to 2,100 low, double up to 4,000, which you know, marries well with the... You know, oh, the wow. And, so, but all these draconian things, do you think they'll happen during any of the green action or it'll happen during the red action going down? The the uh, the extreme Powell. measures that will be introduced by Powell will be in response to the Lehman event later this year. Okay, so in the fall, and then in people the, actually yeah. embrace it, and the market blows to four hundred, and the Fed saved us again. Yes, but the problem they, is, they don't need our hundred dollar bills. We'll pay a wealth tax, anything to you know save the stock market. We'll do our part. Exactly, but if they're going to monetize everything in the process, buy debt, buy stocks, etc., uh, universal in income benefits get rolled out, not just in Stockton or Finland, but uh, broadly, etc., you're spilling money onto the economy. That infrastructure, 1.5 trillion uh, infrastructure spending, uh, it's just the tip of the iceberg. They'll do anything and everything to keep this uh, game going. And uh, that'll lead to a pop, to blow off top. Now, you don't have to get into specific figures. I just threw a 4K on there. Wow. But my time frame matches what, what your friend said, yeah. which is 2021 time frame. That's when it all comes home to roost. That's okay. when we're going to begin the, a multi-year bear market. And what a great problem with this, not, only, not only do nominal values drop significantly, uh, Dale, but real values because the dollar will be you know thrashed in the process with all this money printing that's going okay so that that's going to be 
uh, probably at the end of the year. You think that might be a good time to be looking at gold the end of uh, this year? Well, actually, I, you know, I, I had a whole other presentation on gold, but I think gold is one of those things that you buy and you stash away, you let it collect dust. Okay. It's always a good time to buy gold. Yeah, but I think that... Buy gold, gold, buy gold and wait. Yes, and I, I, as, I, as we talked about initially, um, uh, you were in, this was a part of the discussion with your previous presenter, which is uh, you know, the direction for gold, uh, sorry, for the dollar. Uh, if stocks keep uh, remain under pressure, the dollar is going to have to go get weaker, and that is going to be beneficial for gold and silver. There's a reason gold is resilient right now. And I do see a lower uh, dropping in the short term, but I don't necessarily see lower lows. Uh, but I do see that once this crisis hits in later part of the year, gold and metals may come under pressure because there's a, a, a you know a hugely negative stock market is uh, deflationary in the short term. But the response from the Fed and global central banks will be hugely positive for gold and silver, in my opinion, and negative for fiat currencies, all of them. And okay. You know, I, I will just leave you with a couple of charts. Whenever I get, you know, co uh, comments about whether or not... Doom. Do people well, uh, get turned off when you talk about these things? Well, well, they, well no, no, I think they're starting to come around now that they see there's a two-way market again. I mean, when Bitcoin was going through the roof, I was saying, guys, there's futures markets coming. The manipulation is coming to town. You know, take your profits and run. Nobody, well, few listened, and you know, QED. The same with stocks. I was getting pushback. I posted on January 12th on Twitter that we're going to get a two-way market in the stocks uh, this year. For the first time in a while, we're going to see a correction followed by a bigger one, and I got major pushback on that. And here we are. So uh, I'm hoping I'm developing a level of credibility where, yes, it's an opinion, but it's it's worth considering. And you know, with with, res with respect to gold, um, you know, you get a lot of naysayers. But even when I get a little concerned about the downside and so forth, I just pull out these three charts. This one from uh, uh, Ronald Storfler at uh, Incrementum uh, is a classic. Everybody shared it, even uh, Jeffrey Gundlach. It shows that commodities, and I don't think gold is money. It's not a commodity, but it's treated as such are hugely undervalued. Uh, I'm a cycles guy from a big picture perspective, so gold, the prospects for gold and silver going forward are hugely positive. Uh, there's a second one from Chris Aron, uh, a great chart showing gold relative to the S&P. And here we are down here somewhere, I'd have to get a magnifying glass to see yeah. how <laughs> undervalued gold is. This has to correct, Yeah, and, and it will. And lastly, I have two people I have to thank for my uh, view on gold long term, and that's these two guys. <laughs> <laughs> the, the biggest buyers of gold. Uh, yeah, they are. And and you know what? China's been stockpiling wheat, so they yes. they also see some type of uh, that's part of these cycles too, is uh, you know food shortages and drought and La Nina. And all of that stuff. So yeah, uh, they're they they look like they're pretty tight, and and they've also uh, developed an alternative to the SWIFT system, haven't they, David? Yes, they, they have. China has developed that. I mean, that's part of the whole uh, argument with regard to a weaker dollar is the de-dollarization process that's been led by China and Russia. That includes a non-dollar payment system. The Petro One is coming online on March 26th. Yeah. Uh, that's a huge deal. Uh, Russia has banned trade in dollars uh, at its ports. Um, you know, China's buying uh, oil in, or trying to buy oil in yuan. It's got bilateral agreements with Russia to do so. It's trying to force the Saudis to do the same. It, it, it's all moving in that direction. So whether it's tomorrow, this year, or you know, 2020, 2021, I think the dollar's days as the global reserve currency are numbered. And we're going to move to a supranational currency, which if you read Villa Middlecoop's book, The Big Reset, yeah. Yeah. the Chinese have been very outspoken about this. That that's their goal. And the Chinese and the Russians are chess players. They play the long game, not quarter to quarter, day to day. They play the long game and they're playing it extremely well.
Right. We're playing checkers while they're playing chess. And perfectly put. <laughs> you know what, David? What a great interview. Uh, will you show your website for our viewers uh, that are here live and for the recording so that people know how to reach you and keep in touch as things continue to evolve? And, uh, sure. It's uh, globalprotraders.com is uh, my website. This is it here. Uh, I can you know, go out so you can see the front page. And uh, you can reach me on Twitter at Global Pro Trader without the S. And uh, yeah, I, I, rec I recommend that you come in and just pay a visit. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. There's no credit card details, just an email. When you don't get any spam, it's, it's just to register. And, uh, you know, share your ideas, share your views, share your analysis, uh, get some input from other people. And the one thing I like about this site, opposed to others, is, as you know, Dale, I take a holistic view with regard to my analysis in the short term, which is FIPES, Fundamentals into Market Analysis, Positioning, uh, Elia Wave Theory, Sentiment and Technicals. And I also consider manipulation, especially in these central bank distorted markets. So I think that's unique to this site. And yeah, we've got some great people on here, as you can see. And, yeah, and you always give credit to p other people's work. Uh, I really admire that about you. You know, you show charts and you, you know, and I, I also admire that you're thanking Vlad and, 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 and Chi for, uh, you know, being a good reason to own gold. So, uh, <laughs> you know, really an outstanding presentation, David. I think it's a primer for everyone living in this world of a lot of uncertainty right now that things might be changing to at least consider uh, what they're going to do now that um, things are not just one way and becoming much more volatile. I think the VIX was uh, the bell going off that things have changed. Exactly. And if I could, Dale, can I just make a couple of comments? Sure. One on gold. Take this uh, S&P chart and flip it, and that's my uh, projection for gold, um, without the major downturn. That's what I expect for gold going forward. It's the most undervalued asset, and silver even more so, and it's going to take off. And the other comment I would make is, and this is my parting comment, if there's one thing I would uh, recommend everyone focus on uh, from a big picture perspective, perspective in these volatile markets, is focus on what the Fed is doing in terms of quantitative tightening and when it's going to reverse. Focus on what the Fed is saying. They are critical right now. We've got a two-way market. They are driving the bus. Just follow what they are saying and doing. And when they reverse policy, uh, which I believe is going to be later this year in the Lehman-type uh, crisis, uh, that's when you know that stocks are going to take off again. That's when you know bond yields are going to go down because they're going to be buying every bond out there. And it's the dollar is likely going to uh, pop initially, but then go south again. And precious metals will take off at that point, in my opinion. David, my trading warrior brother, thank you for your time and, and excellent presentation. Real nice visuals along with... Uh, a very uh, interesting outlook and glad I had you here out now that we've crossed the Rubicon. So thanks again, buddy. I appreciate you being you. here. All right. Uh, great. Oh, you know, we're, we're going to do it again. You and I are going to get back together here on base. Um, definitely going into the fall to see what's happening here and uh, just get an, another update on where your head is at at that point. But I, re I really appreciate all the pearls you uh, shared with us today. There are enough pearls to string a necklace. <laughs> so th thank you again, David. Thanks, Dale. Bye-bye. All right. Okay, everybody. So that's going to be a wrap today. Uh, looks like the dollar faded. So I made a lucky guess on trading the strong, hot CPI number. We'll see everyone. Uh, tomorrow, right? So tomorrow's Thursday. We're live streamed by investing.com. Good luck the rest of your day. See you in the private chat. You're welcome, Kareem. Tosin, thank you. Hiya, Stephen. And remember, everyone, no matter what the markets are doing, 
don't just count your pips, count your blessings. See everyone tomorrow. Thanks again, David. Thank you, Dave.